and, and full of him and grace. And oh. I decided, you know, okay, you walk, okay? You just take it for granted. You just walk and you don't even think about it. When something is taken from you and you are in a chair or you have to use a walker, you realize don't take anything for granted because it can change in seconds. Seconds. Yeah, it's true. This was gone for four days. Praise it's God. the longest it's ever been gone. And I figured, <laughs> Praise God. It's gone. <laughs> you know, it, thank you, Lord. It's gone. <laughs> the next day, it came back. Hmm. Then I had it for two days. Last night, it left again. But I have to remember that even if this continues for the rest of my life, because they have no answer, none. The neurologist has no answer. I'm not going back to the Cleveland Clinic because I did that before. So if this is what the Lord has given me, I'm just gonna accept it. I wanna go back to work. I love my job, I love the people, but if it's not to be, it's not to be. And that man sitting over there has been there for me every step of the <laughs> way. God has filled him with his grace and his love and his caring beyond words but I just I just wanted to tell you how how up I feel today I just Please God. I just I, I'm ready to if if it's his will I will start practicing again for my fourth 5k <laughs> good girl to get my fourth medal if it's his will uh, if it isn't then so be it but I just, I love you all. I love this church. I love you, Pastor Jim, Helen. You are, you are our second family. Amen. And I'm so glad that Dawn didn't give up on me. And she kept saying, <laughs> come on, Jen, come to church, come to church. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jen. Well, uh, after that, uh, we need to rock and roll, John? <laughs> okay, good. I want to begin this morning by asking a question. Uh, who do you think is the most evil world leader right now? Get any suggestions? Uh, but there's a lot of them. Not a lot, lot to choose from, isn't there? Does the name Bashar al Bashar al Assad ring a bell? He's the president of Syria. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Syria is just unbelievable. Thousands and thousands of people are are emigrating to other parts of the world just to get away from all the violence, uh, restriction and free speech. He controls the military and yet the military does so much violence but he doesn't take, doesn't take blame for himself. And, uh, and the execution of those little children with, with uh, chemicals is just horrendous. Now there's a, a number of people that have argued that that may have been a setup by Al-Qaeda or ISIS or something like that. But when we think of evil men in this world, a lot of us think of Bashar al-Assad. When we think of the Bible, uh, who's the most evil man in the Bible? Well, there's many to choose from, too. But this morning, we want to encounter one of the most evil men in the Bible, uh, a man that, that's so evil that he becomes the archetype of the, of the Antichrist in the end times, uh, a man that, uh, man that we've encountered in uh, Daniel chapter 8, if you remember the passage. Daniel chapter 8, where uh, Daniel had that vision of uh, the uh, ram battling with the goat and the goat defeats the ram and the goat has a, a giant horn coming out of his head and uh, that horn we determined uh, represented uh, 
Alexander the Great. So the, uh, the horn falls off of the, the goat, and then four other horns uh, arise up. And those four horns represent the four generals that uh, take over the uh, Roman Empire. You've got a general in the north, a general in the south, a general in the east, and a general in the west. Now forget the general in the west and general in, in the east. What, we're, what we concentrate in the book of Daniel is the, uh, the uh, general in the north and the general in the south. So, we, so you have this, this battle. And we saw this in, earlier in chapter 11 where there's a battle between the north and the south. We're not talking about the Union and the Confederacy. We're talking about the Seleucids versus the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies are in the south in Egypt and the Seleucids are in the north in, in Syria. So there's this, this constant tension and the reason that it's important to us is because it all focuses on Israel. So what we want to do today is we want to continue to uh, look at, at the life of this man Antiochus IV. And there's more written about him in the scriptures than, than any, other, uh, any other evil world leader. So let's, let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 11, and we'll pick it up in verse 21. Daniel 11. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And, uh, we look at the difficulty of this passage of Scripture, Lord, and know that uh, the best way to understand it is through the guidance of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that uh, you might guide and help us to understand a very difficult passage, Lord, that we might be uh, better and able to uh, represent Christ well. Uh, for we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. There's a lot of people in this world, in, in our country, that are offended by the idea that uh, we have in our coinage, in God we trust. Now, I understand I get that. You know, if I was an atheist, I wouldn't want that on the coins either. So, so I, I, I totally get that. And, uh, but as, as an evangelical Christian, I look at it and say, well, yeah, that, that coin represents uh, our belief in God and that we believe that God has uh, founded this country, we believe that God set his hand in this country. But let me, uh, let me tweak that for a little bit this morning. What if that coin said, in our God, Donald Trump, do we trust? That'd be a little different. You know, we, we might uh, balk at that. And for some of you conservatives out there uh, who, who actually might like that, what if, what, what, if, what, if, what if it said, in our goddess Nancy Pelosi we trust, or in our god Charles Schumer do we trust? Well, th that becomes an offense to us. Antiochus IV uh, minted a coin when, while he was king that said, Antiochus IV, uh, Epiphanes Theos. Antiochus IV the representation or the manifestation of God. He is the manifestation of God. He represents God. So, the text says here that he will be exceeded, in verse 21, he will be succeeded by a contemptible person. A contemptible person. That word contemptible has the idea of, of something that you despise. If you remember the story of Esau and Jacob, and the, the, the text says that Esau despised his birthright. If you remember the story of Michael and David, Michael was, was David's first wife. She despised his religion. And so that's the word, that these people absolutely despise him. The idea that he, he seems to represent God is an anathema to these people. Uh, they, he, he calls himself Antiochus Epiphanes, and they call him Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, meaning Antiochus, the madman. They have nothing but contempt for him. The text goes on and says that uh, he has been given the, who has, been, who, has ne who has not been given the honor of royalty. In other words, he's not to be the king. If you remember the story uh, from the, earlier in chapter 11, that we saw that Seleucid IV died. His son Demetrius is to be the king. And Demetrius has been taken prisoner by the Roman Empire. Now, something we really got to understand here is that the Roman Empire at this time is a rising to power. They are going to be the dominant power in, in the Middle East now. That, that's going to help us to understand the text. So they, they rise up, they, they take Demetrius. So he, through subterfuge, uh, the text says that they do it with, he does it with deceit. And um, verse 23, after coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully. Uh, he... he he, he, he deceives people into becoming king. He, he's the kind of guy that promises. He promises great things to, to people. He, he, pr he promises positions of power in his administration if you just follow me. The text says also that he will distribute plunder and, and, uh, and loot and wealth among his followers. In other words, he takes from the rich 
and gives it to the poor. He keeps taking and taxing and taxing people and stealing and stealing and just giving it to the poor so he can have more followers. So this way he's deceitfully gaining power. He's a very, very deceptive man who, who, who usurps power, who takes control of the kingdom. And he uses uh, his power, he develops an army, and he dis the text says in verse 22 that an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. So he's, he's got military power, he usurps the throne, he's now in control, he's a very deceptive man, the people do not like him. So he's deceptive in, in gaining power, but he's also deceptive in his ways of uh, dealing with other nations. Uh, well, we speak of evil empires sometimes, evil, empire, evil empires. We, we think of North Korea sometimes, and we think of Kim Jong-un, and uh, we talk about evil dictators. And President Trump, bless his heart, says that he's willing to talk with, with, with uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, which I think is good. The, the previous president said the same thing. Barack Hussein Obama said that he wanted to, to, to talk with him. And so sometimes you think about, you know, okay, we, maybe we can talk this out a little bit, or maybe we can come up with an agreement. Something written on paper, uh, that would, would enable us to, to be friends with North Korea. But do we trust the written paper? Just think of all the agreements that the Palestinians and the Israelis had, the, uh, the Camp David Accords, the, the Oslo Accords. We had all these agreements, and every year there comes up this agreement that the Israelis and the Palestinians are going to come up, and everybody goes, wow, the Palestinians and the Israelis have finally come to an agreement. They've got it on paper that, not, that there's never, <coughs> never going to be violence, and yet the, the violence continues. They continue attacking one another. That's the situation here. He's come up with an agreement. The South, he, he, he overcomes the South. Remember, the, the, he's in the North. He overcomes the South. They set up an agreement. There's going to be no more violence. And what's the first thing he says that in verse 25, with an large army, he will stir up his strength and scourge against the king of the South. In other words, he's going to attack the king of the South. No reason to do it. They've got an agreement. He violates the agreement. Now, the, and the, and the text also says that the king of the South will wage war with a very strong and powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots to against him. So, in the south, there's deceit going on, too. The king at this time is Ptolemy VII, and he's vying for, the, for, the, for power with his younger brother. So, there's, there's plots against him. There's, there's plotting going on in the southern empire. So, and Antiochus the, the, the fourth decides he's going to invade the south one more time, and he's going to take Ptolemy VII as a prisoner. So, he takes him back to, um, to, to the north. So he's, he's got Ptolemy the seventh. Now, the text says in 25, the two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will not stand still at the appointed time. The two kings are going to get together. He's taken prison, prisoner, Ptolemy the seventh, and he's negotiating with Antiochus the fourth. They're sitting, they're dining, they're, they're, they're agreeing on things. And what Antiochus the fourth is saying to Ptolemy the seventh is, hey, look, buddy, we're blood. We're kin. Remember Cleopatra, the uh, daughter of Antiochus III? Not the Cleopatra of Mark Anthony fame, but the daughter of Antiochus III. He sends her to the south so that she can influence Ptolemy VI. But she kind of turns her back on her father, and she unites with, with Ptolemy VI, and they become, they, they have a, a son, Ptolemy VII. So what Antiochus is saying to him is, look, we're blood. We're friends. And Ptolemy the seventh is saying, yeah, yeah, you'll help me overcome my brother who's taken charge of the kingdom up there. You, we'll, work, we'll work together. But they're both lying through their teeth. Antiochus IV wants to take over the south, and, and as, soon as, he gets, as soon as he gets into battle, uh, Antiochus VII is going to turn to his brother and, and side with his brother. So there's, there's deceit, there's this, this, this kind of deceit uh, characterizes his, his administration. He uses deceit to get into power, and he uses deceit to wage negotiations with other countries. He's a deceitful, wicked man. But uh, furthermore, as that, he's, uh, he's bent on destroying Israel. Look at, look at what it says, uh, at an appointed time in verse 29, verse 29 he will invade the south again but this time will will but this time the outcome will be different from it will be before ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart did you ever hear that phrase uh, make make your decision according to a, a, a line drawn in the sand did you ever hear that, that 
that, that, that expression. That expression comes from this. When, when he goes to, the, to invade the South this time, the South uh, solicits the help of the Romans. Remember, the Romans are, are the, 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 the thriving force in, in the Middle East now. So the, 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 the people of the South say, be our ally. And so the Romans decide that they're going to help the South. So when Antiochus IV attacks, they bring out a Roman general named Paul. Well, his name is Nimus. His name is Nimus. And he, he takes his sword and he draws, he draws a circle around Antiochus IV and says, I want you to make a decision. Before you step over that line drawn in the sand, you're going to tell me whether or not you're going to invade the South. Antiochus realizes with the, the, the threat and the power of the Roman Empire, he's not going to do it. So he decides he's going to turn back and go home with his tail tucked under, under him. So he turns back and he turns his, um, he turns his fury against the, the people of Israel. Let's, let's read it. He will, he will turn back and he will, he will vent his fury against God's holy covenant. He will return and show favor to those who, who forsake the holy covenant. So he draws the line in the sand. He goes back to Israel and he's going to take out all his anger on Israel. He gets an army of 2,000 people and he destroys the city of Jerusalem. He burns it to the ground. He kills men, women, and children and, used, and uses the seed subterfuge in order to uh, entice people to change their ways and become more Greek. He's, what he's, his basic thrust of, of what he wants to do is Hellenize the country of Israel. And people do it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll do anything for money. You know, they'll, they'll just change their mind if you, if you offer them enough money. <laughs> you see that all the time. You know, you watch uh, commentators on one particular channel. They might be a conservative. If they go to, to a liberal channel, they'll become liberal. You know, if they're liberal, they'll go to a conservative channel, they become conservative. Money talks. You're giving me $2 million a year, I'll say anything. Well, that's, that's what these people are. They become Hellenized. And uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he's just pent on destroying uh, the religion of Israel. So he's banned the use of the Bible, banned the scriptures. He has um, burned the city, and that we don't know where, but he sets up an altar to Zeus. He sets up an altar to Zeus. Uh, we don't know if it's in the, in the temple or not, but he sets up an altar, and they have to take a pig and sacrifice the pig on this altar. Now, a pig is, is an anathema to the Jewish people, but they are to sacrifice a pig every 25th of every month to commemorate Antiochus the the, the fourth uh, birth, so he's uh, he works to uh, just Hellenize Israel, and people are falling for it, uh, you know, and uh, Israel is becoming Hellenized. But there are certain people uh, that uh, that don't submit to it. God's always got his uh, his righteous remnant. I saw a. Uh, a story on the news last week. It was, it was just an amazing story. These two young children, I don't know if they were 15 or 16 years old, they were at a, uh, they're, they're, they're homeschool kids, they're Christians, and they went to a, 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 a school where they're having some kind of a demonstration, and uh, they were demonstrating against abortion in this, <laughs> outside the school. And the principal just started cursing and swearing at these kids and, you know, just, just being just as angry as angry can be. And these kids are standing there telling them about Jesus Christ. And what was the most, I think the most amazing part was the, 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 the moderator of, of, the, of the news story encouraged him. He let him talk about Jesus Christ. See, God's got his people. God's got his people that will never turn their back. And that's what he's talking about here. There are those who will, there are those who are wise, who will instruct many, for though for a time they will fail by the sword or the burned or captured or plundered, when they fail, they will receive a little help, and for many who are sincere will join them. Some of them will be, some of the wise will stumble, so they will be refined, purified, and made, and made spotless until the time of the of the end, for it will, for it will still come at an appointed time. There's word in the Bible that uh, it's a great, great Hebrew word. The word is hesed, hesed, and it means loyal love. And you'll see that word infrequently in the Bible, hesed loyal love. God's, God has a loyal love toward his people. God loves to make covenants with his people and he loves to keep those companies. That's the word hesed means. It's a very important word. And uh, what they're talking about here is the hasidim. 
the ones that are have that loyal love toward God, and they will never ever turn their back upon God. And uh, what he's talking about are the Essenes. If you remember the Essenes, they started this this uh, this community in in Qumran near near the Dead Seas, and they they're they're not going to they're not going to be affiliated with all those people that have turned their back on God and become Hellenized. They're going to start their community, and they're going to devote themselves totally to God. And you see it in the Pharisees. I know we, sometimes we look at Pharisees and uh, we we you know we kind of you know, famous a little because because some of the Pharisees are put down in the Bible. But those Pharisees kept the faith. They, they, de they determined that they were not going to be Hellenized and that they were going to, f they were going to follow God no matter what. So, and, and so they're, they're to, be, uh, uh, to be commended for that. And you see, you see examples of the Hasidim in, in, in our culture today. If you ever heard the term Hasidic Jews, Hasidic Jews, that word comes from the word Hesed. They love the covenant, they love God, and they're going to follow God according to what God has revealed in the Old Testament. So they're, they're part of the Hasidim. And of course, we, we see this also, we mentioned this in, in chapter 8, where uh, Mattathias uh, revolts against Antiochus IV, where uh, one of the generals comes out and demands that Matthias sacrifice a pig at an altar, and, and Mattathias plunges a sword into him. His three sons run into, run into, the, uh, run into the woods or the countryside and they start this revolt against, uh, against Antiochus IV. And the text says that some, some will do it, uh, some will do it uh, for, for, for maybe the wrong reasons. He says that and many who are not sincere will join them. Well, they're not sincere in the sense that they're not doing it for God, they're doing it just to keep their country free. But it's, it, they still keep it free. Uh, the Maccabees, Judas Maccabee, the son of Mattathias, has a successful revolt against, against uh, Antiochus IV, and they actually establish their freedom. And the text says that uh, they do it at the appointed time. Well, the appointed time comes from uh, chapter 8, where, uh, where we learn that there's going to be uh, 2,130 day and night sacrifices uh, till, till the end comes. Well, 200. 2,130 sacrifices day and night comes out to 1,115 days. So that's the duration of all of this. And that after 1,115 days, Antiochus IV is finally defeated and the people finally have their freedom and they're able to celebrate with the, that's what they celebrate the, the festival of Hanukkah for. They finally establish their own freedom. The question is, how does, that do, how does this all apply to us this morning? You know, we live in this world that just seems to be getting crazier and crazier every day, and we see less and less people maybe going to church, and, and, and you really wonder what's going what's to happen to Christianity in a few years, and what's going to happen to this world. But God's always got His righteous remnant. You know, we saw that in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, when Elijah cries out to God and says that I'm the only one that opposes Baal. And God says in 19:18 that I've got 7,000 men that will not bow their knee to bow. So God's looking for a righteous remnant. As we go through this world and things get worse and worse and worse, let us vow that we're going to stay close to Christ, that we're going to follow his, his, example, his example of a covenant and remain faithful to his covenant, remain faithful to Christ no matter what happens. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord. And uh, Father, as we... Uh, contemplate all that went on in this passage and the difficulty of it, Lord. And uh, We thank you so much for your grace and your love, Lord. May we be your righteous remnant, Father. You've got righteous remnant in every culture of all times, Lord. There's always people that will stand up for you and your word, no matter what happens to them. So, Father, I pray that you'll bless us, encourage us, and help us to be able to stand strong during difficult times. We pray in the precious name of the Savior. Amen. 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 <clears throat>